Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, delighted to have uh, Rob Krasinski today talking about writing style. All right, now it's on to Rob. All right, so I've got a whole presentation on style, but I wanted to follow up on something Maritza said, which I, I didn't have a chance to- Joya? Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Something Joya said. I didn't have a chance to follow up on this. Uh, I'm putting you on the spot, Maritza, and I'm stealing the credit from Joya for it. Uh, no, but I didn't have a chance to look this up, but it was written in 1940. I think that what she had in mind, when Henry Hudorn has this novel that was published and he feels that all the reviews missed the point, even the positive ones. I think that was her really writing about We the Living, which had, you know, not had, it had a lot of negative reviews. It had a lot of people who missed the point. There's the whole, I've read some of the original reviews at the time and they, you know, they really did miss the point of the book. Um, and I, I suspect that it was probably, if it's in 1940, it was probably right before she got picked up, she got right before the Fountainhead got picked up for publication. So it would have been right at the point, you know, because, you know, a year later and, and this whole thing about the struggling writer uh, not being accepted and being ignored might have been a little obsolete for her because she was about to be rocketed on to fame and fortune. Uh, as a novelist, but I think that that was the time at which, you know, she was rejected by something like 11 publishing houses for the Fountainhead before she got picked up. Um, so, you know, it's right in that, that moment of having done something, a great novel and not having been appreciated for it and not yet having had, uh, contract, yeah. So the, uh, okay, Sherry looked it up. Yeah, so she got her contract with, was it Random House? Mm, yes. Yeah, I think she yeah. got her contact with, contract with Random House for the Fountain. I think it was Bob's Merrill for the, the oh, Fountain House. Yeah, okay. Bob's yeah. Merrill. Uh, she got her contract with Bob's Merrill in 1941. So this is like right the year before she had her big break. So you can sort of see she's in that middle, that she's still very much struggling in that middle area. Um, all right. So the, the, uh, the short story, I think, is actually a great way to springboard onto the issue of style because this is where she's really actually talking about presenting you with the creative process from the perspective of the writer. And what she's presenting to you is in many ways, the style of Henry Dorn as a writer, which is really a stand in for the style of Ayn Rand as a writer. And it's the style of one particular aspect. Because when we think about style, we tend to think about you know how you write sentences and uh, the kind of words somebody uses, the kind of names they picked for the characters. And, and we tend to think of it on that sort of nuts and bolts, uh, execu you know, sentence by sentence execution kind of level. But style applies on the highest level. It's style is the choice of content. And you can see that uh, that's something she's been, the selectivity of content is something she's been of what you choose to portray, what aspects of human life you choose to show, what kind of people you choose to show. That's been a major running theme throughout the whole book. And the idea that that's what the artist does, that's, you know, that's how the artist conveys his view of the world is by selecting what content to choose and what things to show, uh, what kind of people and what kind of actions. And so she's been, so she's showing you that in this character of Henry Dorn. And you'll notice the things that he does and the, the words that come out, the, the, the description is that he always, every time he comes up with a story idea, he can't just let it lie as like a very simple, as some simple little unimportant story. He always has to go for what would be the most interesting thing you could do. It. What's the most important thing you could do with it? The word important comes up a whole bunch of times. We've talked about that here before. Interest, interesting and important are these metaphysical terms. What has greater metaphysical significance? What's exciting? What's unusual? And always bringing everything out to the biggest possible idea. And, you know, he. he he starts out with some very simple idea for a story that says, no, if I add to this, I go this direction, it'll show everything that's going on in the world today, right? So he, was, he always wanted to get to the heart, the big ideas behind everything that's going on in the world. Uh, and that's the selectivity that he's showing. That's his style in terms of the selection of content. Well, I think there's a lot of parallels and I've been noticing this all along. And so that's why I wanted to do a presentation like this. There's a lot of parallels to that for the non, uh, for the fiction writer, what the fiction writer does. There's a lot of parallels to the nonfiction writer. Now, um, as a nonfiction writer, I can't make up or invent the, 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 the facts or events that I'm, that I'm talking about. I, I, I would get in a small amount of trouble for that. 
Only small. Yeah, only not not very not my not very much trouble, which is sort of our problem today. But I would get in some trouble. It would make me disreputable in some quarters, um, and would probably make me very successful in others. Uh, but uh, but you know, as sticking to being a nonfiction writer, to the code of the nonfiction writer, I cannot make up the events. But like Henry Dorn, I can choose what kind of events to present, you know, what things to write about and what things not to write about. So for example, I'm not going to write, you know, some of you may have seen this, I'm not going to write a big article about Ted Cruz flying to Cancun while Texas has an ice storm. It's like, okay, there's something to be said there, but everybody's already said it in the first five minutes on Twitter. There's nothing big and important and exciting behind that. That's, that's there's a lot of trivial, you know, I, a lot of, some of the writing I do is about politics. There's a lot of trivial flotsam and jetsam that comes up day to day in politics. And it all gets, you know, whatever there is to be said on it gets said you know, in 15 minutes on Twitter and there's really not much more to add. So the, the in terms of the, the choice of content and what I choose to write about, what I choose to highlight and, and, and regard as important is a major part of uh, a major stylistic decision for a writer. You know, what niche are you going for? What kind of, uh, what kind of writer do you want to be? What style or what, what audience are you trying to attract? Or, or, or what I would say audience, audience you're trying to attract because it sounds like you're picking an audience and you're pandering to them, but more like what sort of audience do you have in mind as the sort of people you would like to be talking to? Uh, what, sort of, what sort of mind do you have in mind as the mind that you want to communicate ideas to? And what are they going to be interested in? Uh, and uh, so the example I chose here is that I'm going to be referring to a couple of times that I had to sure kind of send out the link on this uh, is an article I wrote, if you can see that called. Uh, no, I can't see that. Yeah, probably not. Okay, it was called Laurel and Yanni and Manny and Ein. And this was, uh, so I, I decided to choose not to choose a, po a political article that I've done because Sherry keeps telling me politics is ugly and this is the romantic <laughs> manifesto, so we're talking about beauty. So I'm not allowed to do something in politics. I chose something that was more of a philosophical article. And this is when I wrote about May of 2018, so about three years ago. And it was a, just to summarize it for those who may not have read it or uh, just to give a, a, a overview of it before us to continue on. Uh, it's called Laurel and Yanni and Manny and I. So Laurel and Yanni, as the people may remember this, there was this big uh, sort of, a meme going around in the internet or a post going around in the internet about Laurel versus Yanni. So the, the idea of this is that uh, there was an audio clip at a, a website, a vocabulary website that was supposed to give an example for the pronunciation of the word Laurel, as in a Laurel wreath, you know, Laurel, the, the plant. And what was interesting is that a young listener, a high school student went and got and saw this article, saw this, went to the site to get the pronunciation and to her, it sounded like Yanni. And so it's one of these things that goes around. And, you know, a couple of years previously, it had been, there was a photo of a, a black and blue dress in a shop window, but half the people who saw it swore blind that it was a white and gold dress. And there was this incredible argument between people said, no, it's white and gold, no, it's blue and black. And neither one could imagine why, how, how anybody else could see it differently. So it's one of these sort of obstacle illusions where it could be, seen or in this case heard ambiguously. And so there's a big discussion about why do some people see that, hear this as Laurel and how, why do some people hear it as Yanni? And it turns out to have to do, and I explained this in the first little section, I just introduced that, that controversy and a, a very simple explanation of it, which is that if you boost the high frequencies, if you increase the, the volume of the high frequencies of the sound, it sounds like Yanni. And if you boost, if you go to the lower, if the lower frequencies predominate, it sounds like Laurel. And because young people uh, had, tend to be better at perceiving high pitches, that makes sense that a high school student would hear this as Yanni, whereas you know us older folks would hear it as Laurel. So it's a very simple explanation for it. But then I, the second section as I transition into is that this is being taken as an excuse to make these sort of philosophical. Uh, it's be, that this uh, popular controversy over Laurel versus Yanni is being abused to make a tendentious philosophical point. And people saying that, well, it just shows that everything's really subjective and you can't, none of us really can have contact with reality. None of us could even communicate with other people because 
you know, our, this Laurel versus that some people see this as Laurel and some people see this as Yanni shows that consciousness is just a subjective experience inside your own brain and that everybody lives in a different uh, hallucination than everybody else. And uh, so I then the third section is I then explain that part of the controversy by reference to this is where Manny comes in and it's purely for the alliteration with Yanni. Uh, but I, referred to, I, I trace that back to the ideas of Immanuel Kant and his views about consciousness and the nature of consciousness. And he was the one who really pioneered this idea that because you know, you're the, uh, how you perceive the world is mediated by the senses by which you use, that you use the sense mechanisms that you use to perceive it. Therefore, you don't really see the world as it is. You see it only as it appears to you. And he was the one who honed that argument about how perception our, our, our perception of the world is subjective. And then I oppose him to giving, by giving Ayn Rand's answer to that argument, or which her argument is that, well, of course the world is mediated by our sense perception and that's what makes it more accurate. And, and that's what puts us in touch with reality because our experience is the product of a cause and effect relationship that starts with the thing itself and you know, the, the things out in the world and goes through our cause and effect chain into our consciousness. And that's the normal way it should be. And, and uh, uh, she said that Kant is creating a, a false expectation uh, that there be a, a mystical way of understanding the world directly without any mechanism. It's that all, all knowledge is process knowledge is her response to him. All right, so then after that, I go back to reanalyze the Laurel versus Yanni and the, the black, and, uh, black and blue dress and the white and, black and blue versus white and gold dress going into more of the details of wh what produces those, um, those optical or auditory illusions by showing that it's actually because our, our eyes and ears and brains are so well adapted to seeing things, to perceiving things in the real world and to making adjustments for things like frequency of sound or adjustments for ambient light. And it's precisely because of that, they make those adjustments that you can create these optical illusions uh, often artificially create these optical illusions that will sort of trip them up under unusual circumstances. But if the only reason that, that those work is because our senses are so good, so well attuned to perceiving the world. So it's returning back to that initial, the deeper explanation of the Laurel versus Yandy thing, but in the context of, with the context established of that philosophical context of explaining why the senses are valid because they are adapted and um, uh, through a cause and effect relationship to perceiving the world. So that's the overall structure of the piece. Now I wanna look at it, use this piece as uh, from, from the overall, from the highest level down to the smallest level as an example of style in writing for the nonfiction writer. And so I want you to notice one thing which is sort of a, a little bit of a parallel not an exact parallel but to the uh, short story that Ayn Rand writes about, about Henry Dorn and how he's, choosing, how he's choosing the topic, the subject matter that he wants to write about. I said he's looking for the interesting, the important, the exciting, and for something that cuts down to the deepest big ideas. Well, that's something that I try to do and, and something that uh, uh, I think is, is similar to my style in terms of the choice of content. So notice here that I'm looking for the strange and the unusual, and in this case, the seemingly trivial, right? So this is just, you know, a, a joke thing people are passing around on the internet that, hey, isn't it weird that this, this clip sounds different to different people? So it's something a strange, unusual, seemingly trivial, but which ends up being connected down to deep, uh, highly abstract philosophical issues. I mean, it really goes down to the whole question of what is the nature of consciousness and what is the relationship of consciousness to existence on the very highest uh, level? And I, you know, I end up talking about Immanuel Kant's critique of pure reason, which is this extremely abstract and obscure work of philosophy and then Ayn Rand's answer to it. So that's sort of what I like to do is, is take a sometimes a, a, an unusual and sometimes seemingly insignificant concrete and use it as a springboard to go down to a much deeper and more interesting and very broad philosophical issue. So that's why I think there's a, a parallel there. I, I'm sort of recognizing the parallel there. 
uh, with uh, this this uh, this short story and that that same sort of attitude of like, well, what if you know you could take this this little optical illusion thing and you could trace it all the way back down to Immanuel Kant and the 18th century philosophy and and uh, uh, and and the, you know, the 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 nature of consciousness itself and use that to explain a deep big philosophical idea. So it's a very similar uh, sort of mindset to what Ayn Rand is describing in this, uh, uh, in this uh, short story as to the choice of content. Now, the second thing, the second level to look at, at, at style, uh, from the, going from the choice of content, we go down to the structure. Now, one thing I want you to notice, and I, I didn't want to go through a lot of examples of this, but you can just, you know, open the internet and start reading. Uh, start reading somewhere randomly on the internet and you'll see this, that a lot of uh, what's done in the media today is what is called a rant, right? So it's a series, somebody, somebody gets upset or, or excited or angry about something and they go and they give you a series of random observations, you know, uh, piled on top of that thing. And oftentimes you'll see things that are very unstructured, uh, particularly in politics, but really every, everywhere, but particularly in politics. These things that are kind of un, uh, unstructured series of random observations and pot shots. And in this case though, one of the things, and, and I think Joya will know this and probably Shrikant too, those who've been in my writing class know that I spend a lot of time talking about structure in writing and about how to create a structure. And the idea is you know, that, that the sort of pouring out ideas onto paper uh, just whatever tumbles into your head and whatever gets you excited about the topic, that's a great thing to do before you start doing the actual writing. It's a great thing to do when you're putting together your outline or you're just brainstorming ideas. And you should do that in this sort of uncontrolled and unedited way. But then the stage comes, once you have all those things out there, then you have to organize them and you have to take the reader on a step-by-step -step logical path. So in my little... Um, uh, uh, in, my, in my little uh, description of the piece that I just, of this article that I just did, you notice that I had to say that there are four sections to it. So it starts with a simple sort of first pass, first level description of the auditory illusion of Laurel versus Yen. And then it takes it to, well, here then, here's the, the philosophical point people are trying to make about it, about how it's all subjective. And then going from there to, all right, now underneath that, here's the deep fundamental philosophical issue that goes all the way back to Kant, even if the people, you know, people writing in popular magazines haven't, may not have read Kant, they may not know they got this from Kant, but here's the deep philosophical root that, that this comes from, and here's the deep philosophical answer to it. And then returning back to the concrete and looking at the concrete again in more detail, but with armed with this deeper philosophical perspective that helps us to understand it. Now, what you notice I'm doing there is I don't have to have a clear structure in terms of guiding the reader through one step at a time, but it's kind of an inductive structure. That is, it's a structure that starts with concretes, builds to more abstract issues, and then to more abstract issues, and then goes back to the concretes and revisits the concretes having gone through all, having gone all the way up to the abstractions. So we go from the concretes to the abstractions and then back down to the concretes and we're able to connect them and integrate them together. Um, so it's beginning and ending at a concrete level. Uh, and that's something that I want you to notice that uh, I think actually in, in so many, many ways, some, ask, some of the chapters in the Rantic Manifesto are not Ayn Rand at her best as a nonfiction writer. Because I think sometimes when she talks about philosophy, we've noticed, we said before, sometimes she speaks in sort of shorthand, where she writes these very, very dense uh, sentences full of very you know, big ideas and, and new abstractions and new definitions of new terms. Um, my favorite uh, articles of Ayn Rand articles, the nonfiction articles by Ayn Rand, are the ones where she takes a more inductive style like this, where she starts with the concrete and she goes from the concrete to big abstract issues, but it's all in the context of, you know, coming from and returning to the concretes of commenting on, you know, the best, I think her best articles, including some of her best philosophical articles are ones where she is 
nominally commenting on the news, right? So she's writing something about the uh, uh, Republican National Convention of 1964 and comes up with a new concept in epistemology <laughs> but, you know, by watching the speeches at, at a political convention. Or uh, my, I think probably my, my all-time favorite of her articles is one called Apollo and Dionysus. So she wrote, she did this in 19, I don't know if it was published in, May, I think it may have been delivered in 1970, but it was written in 1969. And it was after the uh, two big events that happened in the summer of 1969. You had the moon landing and you had Woodstock. So you had all the you know, half a million hippies gathering at Woodstock. And she took, takes this, you know, commenting on these two big uh, events that got a lot of attention in 1969 and uh, you know, uh, connects it to this idea of Apollo and Dionysus. You get the idea of Apollo was the link in to the moon missions, but Apollo represents the God of reason and order and science. And Dionysus is the God of drunkenness and, and wild uncontrolled emotion. And using that, that philosophy and using the, these, these big events of 1969 that were in the you know, newspaper reports about these big events and using that to connect to these deep philosophical issues about the nature, the role of reason and the role of emotion. Uh, so that I think is her, some of her best writing is where she's starting in concretes, bringing you down from the concretes to the deeper philosophical issues. And uh, again, that's a big influence on my writing and something that you'll see I, I was trying to do with the structure here. So that's in the choice of structure, you can see how you're making stylistic choices, right? So your, your structure is, a, is, is what you're really saying is, what is the, the style of logical thinking that I'm trying to appeal to and encourage in the kind of reader I'm trying to reach, right? So the, and in this case, the style of logical thinking, is, the style of thinking is somebody who is interested in, uh, who can, who's, um, can be drawn from an interesting and suggestive concrete fact down to a deeper and more profound and more abstract explanation, but one that is rooted in and integrated back to all the concrete details of the fact. So it's a it's an inductive, uh, an integrate integra inductive approach and an integration of reason and um, uh, or uh, integration of abstractions and concretes. Ask you a question before you go. Yes, please ask me. Okay, I'm going to take the prerogative to to jump in and ask a question right there. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, I know this is how you write because mm -hmm. whenever we're driving around in the car, I get treated to the rough draft in his brain before it ever gets put on paper. Yeah. Um, and so I see this in um in a, a, a literally a daily basis. Was that that stop that approach to the structure? Was that always an explicit thought process, or did it really start almost at when you first started doing it? Was it more of a subconscious? Uh, no, it was sense more of life kind of thing. Okay, this is something I have. Well, it's a little bit of each, but okay. I, I cultivated this approach. Yeah, more explicitly and more um, more as a conscious, deliberate thing years ago when I was starting out as a writer. Now, what happens now is, so I know Joya knows that I, I would put my writing course students through <laughs> all, all this rigmarole to, you know, how do you create an outline and, and, and why you shouldn't use a Roman numeral outline, which is terrible, and, and, uh, and how, how, to, how to create a structure and how to do this. And I used to do that a lot myself. I hardly ever do an outline anymore um, because after, finally, after 10, 15 years of doing it, it all gets sort of programmed in and becomes subconscious. So I never, I don't have to do a lot of work on the outline unless I get into a lot of trouble on an article. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes I get to, you know, you have that sort of like, well, how do I solve this? What am I doing here? Um, you know, it's a piece seems to want to go one direction and then I got this other issue and I can't put them together. Then I have to stop and I may have to go back and rearrange things. But after a while that becomes the, the way you, you the, the act of structuring an article and the kinds of structure you put you you put it in, you tend to put it into, that becomes I won't say automatic, but it becomes habitual. That you have good habits that help steer you in that direction, mm -hmm. so you don't have to think it through in a fully uh, um, explicit way every time you do it. 
See, I think that's fast. We've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. I think this is fascinating because to me, this sounds very much like the way an artist would approach mm -hmm. a project as well. Um, again, after decades of doing it, it becomes very habitual. Um, your, uh, maybe it's the, the layout of your painting, the structure of your painting, something like that, that becomes really habitual. Yeah. Um, and so, and you know, I, I do, for the feedback I get from articles, I often will think when I get feedback that I really like, I'll think, okay, that was what I was trying to achieve. Now, what was it exactly the person said? So one thing that really struck me once is I think one of your, this is like way, way years ago when you were working at a big corporation, one of your coworkers read a particle I wrote and said, you know, what I really liked about it was as I was reading, every time a question would come up on my mind, like, well, what about such and such? I'd read the next paragraph and he would answer there that question. Me. And that's sort of like, I that sort of ticked the little mental box when I heard that. I said, yes, that's exactly what I should be trying to do. That it should proceed in such a logical way that I am anticipating every, every, at every point when I make, when I say something, I'm anticipating what is the reader going to need to know next? What's going to be his next question, the next, uh, the next fact or the next argument or the next distinction that needs to be made in order to clarify this issue in his mind so that I can move forward with the argument. And what ends up happening nowadays mm -hmm. is if I'm reading a draft of something that he's written, um, I'll stop in the middle. And I don't know why I still do this because I, 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 I should know better <laughs> at this point, but I'll be reading along and I'll get to the end of a paragraph and then I'll say, hey, hey, Rob, what about you're going to, what about this, the, this next argument? And inevitably he says, in this really dry tone, read the next paragraph. <laughs> I say keep reading. Keep, keep reading. reading. Keep, keep reading. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, you know, I, I don't say I always manage to succeed, but that is the goal. And that, you know, and that was a very explicit thing that when I heard that person say that is like that set a marching order in my mind that this mm -hmm. is what you should be trying to do. And so you'll notice, you know, there there are people, um, uh, authors take you in different, uh, uh, nonfiction authors will take you on different kind of journeys. So, some people, you know, will actually write very interesting articles that are very meandering, you know, and, and if there are some people who can get away with it because they have so many interesting thoughts that each thought is interesting on its own, even if they don't really, if they just sort of meander around and don't add up to anything, you still like, well, you know, but there are a lot of interesting ideas in there, but they don't necessarily, you know, coalesce together. The, um, was it? I wrote a wrote something once about uh, Tom Wolfe, uh, the, the the essay writer, and later became a novelist, Tom Wolfe. But I was most interested in him as an essay writer. And he wrote brilliant essays. They were terrible in terms of their structure. I mean, and, and I always talked about in my writing courses. Um, you, I don't know if I probably did this in the one Joya was in that I often would use him as I use him the same way that uh, Ayn Rand uses Thomas Wolfe. All right, the, the, the earlier late 19th, the early 20th century novelist is a sort of example of what not to do. And I would use Tom Wolfe as an example of what not to do. And the reason I did that is because Tom Wolfe was so good at what he did that he was the guy who was style over substance. So he was funny and he came up with you know, crazy catchphrases and uh, was just immensely entertaining to read. But in terms of logical structure, he was all over the place and oftentimes didn't cohere together into any logical point that he was making. Uh, and so I sort of used him as an example of what not to do because a lot of writers would read him and say, I want to write like that. Oh, well, well, well remember that, 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 that paragraph that he wrote there or that sentence he wrote over here, wasn't that great? And he would sort of like lure them over the cliff because the thing is that unless you're absolutely as brilliant at it as, to, as Tom Wolfe is, you're going to try to do the same thing and you're just going to, and you're going to end up coming up with something that is just an unreadable mess, right? So... <laughs> you know, he, he could sort of get away with doing it because he was so brilliant at that stylistic element that nobody really cared whether it made a logical argument or not. But very few other people can get away with that. So that's sort of, I would sort of regard him as an antipode in that way, that he was very brilliant on the stylistic level on the sentences and paragraphs and, and you know, very extremely funny and witty, but not having the logical structure and not being able to sort of put together a step-by-step -step logical argument that would that would all lock together. And that brings me down though to the issue of what most people think of as style in writing, which is 
how do you put a sense, how do you put sentences together? The distinctive way that you put sentences together, the distinctive way you put uh, paragraphs together, the distinctive way that you that, that you choose words. I, the main categories I put here are grammar and word choice. Now, I did a whole in my writing courses, I used to do a whole large section on grammar. And the big message I had in what I wrote about grammar is most people that go to school and they think of grammar as a set of rules imposed on you from above. You know, these are rules you got to reach. And, and, and they're rules that sort of tamp down on your creativity. And I had very much the idea that the rules of grammar are not a bunch of you know, restrictions imposed on you from above. You should think of them as tools. You should think of them as the palette of a painter, right? So a painter wants to express himself. He has his paints, he has his brushes. And these are all the tools that he can use to say, well, I'd like to create a big swash of color here. Oh. I like to create fine brush strokes over here. I want bright colors. I want muted colors. These are all the different things that he has that he's able to use. And you should look at grammar like that. And this now this is a whole, I did a whole lecture or a lecture and a half or so on this. Uh, and this is a much larger topic. But the idea is that grammar is the tools that you have to use to express yourself. And how you, how you use grammar uh, we'll do that. I'm going to give just one example because it's one that comes up a lot. I call it the, uh, it's, it's the M dash. And I sometimes call it the objectivist dash, which kind of sounds like a foot race, but uh, the, the objective, you know, I call it the objectivist dash because objectivists love to use it. Ayn Rand loves to use it. You might notice, so in this Laurel and Yanni and Manny and Ayn article that I did, I've got like three very small quotes from Ayn Rand that I have in there. And in every single one of those quotes, there's an M dash. It's, it's almost next, it's next to impossible to quote Ayn Rand for any length of time without getting an end dash. She loved to use it. Or, uh, hand me the book there. This one? Yeah. Or just in the previous chapter from this one in Romantic Manifesto. Did you use mine or yours? I, I got it here. Yeah. She has uh, something that's extremely distinctive to Ayn Rand, and it's a grammatical style, a grammatical technique she uses. It's extremely distinctive to her. And so she's talking about this issue of selectivity, and essentially a paragraph on selectivity in regard to subject, which we were just talking about. And she says, in literature, this means colon, the story, M dash, which means colon, the plot and the characters, M dash, which means colon, the kind of men and events which the writer chooses to portray. So those who've read a lot of Ayn Rand will know that this is totally recognizable. She does this probably about a dozen times in different articles here and there. This construction, which means colon, and then M dash, which means colon, M dash, which means, you know, that way of constructing a sentence. And what she's usually doing in this case, you'll notice she says, the story, which means the plot and characters, which means the kind of men and events that a writer chooses to portray. Now here's what she's doing is she's giving a broad abstract term, the story, and then translating it down to more and more concrete terms as she goes. And that's typically how she uses this construction. She uses it when she's going from the more concrete, uh, basically she's restating the same idea over and over again, but either going from the more concrete to the more abstract or from the more abstract to the more concrete. Uh, and it's, it's very distinctive to her. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, it's something she returns to, I think probably like a dozen times across her very, the various articles she's written. And you can see why this would appeal to her because this idea of saying, of, of making these big grand intellectual connections that will go from the concrete to the abstract or from the abstract to the concrete and doing it by going, you know, which means, which means, which means, which means, just taking you from one layer down to another layer, down to another layer, down to another layer, and not doing it across a paragraph, but doing it all in the same sentence, all as one thought. So it's like you have one thought that goes from the most abstract down to the most concrete, or one thought that goes from the most concrete all the way up to the most abstract. You can see how that would appeal to her as a style of writing and as a style of thinking. She wants to, and it, when you talk about a style of writing, you're really talking about, in some ways, a style of thinking. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to provide an example or an, uh, uh, she talked about art as model building, right? You build the model of what it is like to live in a certain way. Well, this is the, you're building, you're showing, you're, pre you're presenting a model of what it is like to think in a certain way. And this sort of, which means colon M dash, 
that structure is her providing you a model of how to think in a way that carries you in one single thought from the high concrete down high abstraction down to the to the to the most specific concrete. Um, now I should mention that that Ayn Rand isn't the only person who likes the M dash. Um, I I'm sort of the informal head of a support group on Twitter for uh, for addicts. Uh, the first step is recognizing <laughs> that you have a problem. So we have to start by saying, my name is Robert Trzynski and I am an M-dash abuser. Uh, Ash mentions here too. <laughs> yes. Ash mentions. <laughs> um, so the, uh, it can be overused. So sometimes I have to go through and say, okay, do I really need all these M-dashes? I think the reason writers like the M-dash is it's kind of festival for us because <laughs> What an M dash does. So the way Iron Man is using it, and the thing that I was just talking about is one way of using the M dash is um, is an is as an apposite, which means that you basically your restate is that you have this break on either side of the M dash. You, uh, the other side of the M dash, you're just restating the same thing. So you're restating the same idea in different terms. That's one way of using it. But more broadly, the M dash, the great the thing that's addictive about the M dash. It is, it is a grammatical break. So when you, you're going along, you're reading something. Uh, the end, what the M dash tells you is all the grammatical structure that was created in the sentence before the M dash, you can kind of ignore that. And we're going to start all over again. We have a grammatical do-over in this sentence. And we can start over with a different grammatical construction in a different grammatical direction. And writers love that because it gives you this tremendous freedom, allows you to play around with your grammatical structure and do things you it would be hard or fudgy to do without, without that kind of grammatical break, it, it can also be a bit of a crutch and we can overuse it. So that's why we have our support group. <laughs> um, now, what you'll notice here though, is that in this particular article, the Laurel and Yanni and Manny and Ein article, I was sort of looking through, okay, what did I do any sort of pyrotechnics like that with the grammar, grammatical structure? And the main thing I noticed is that no, I didn't. And I think, looking back on it, trying to remember I was writing it, I think that I knew I was taking on such a big abstract topic. You know, I'm going all the way down to this topic about what is the very nature of consciousness uh, at its fundamental level. I was going down to, you know, as I mentioned, Immanuel Kant. Now, you know, The Critique of Pure Reason is one of these books that I like to say should only be read by a trained professional with proper medical supervision. <laughs> uh, it, it is famously obscure and, uh, you know, was, was that what I've heard is that uh, German students will read English in order to read Kant in translation because the translators have done such a good job of making his sentences more comprehensible than they were in the original. Uh, so he is very, he, he, he's very famous for doing sort of the opposite of what a good writer should strive to do, for having these long, complicated, convoluted sentences where by the time you get to the end, you have no idea where, where you started at the beginning. Um, and I realized that in, in the sentence structure of the grammatical style of this particular article, I was, I think, very conscious of going the opposite direction, of having everything be in very clear and direct sentences. Uh, I have to clear a, a direct grammatical structure with an active voice. Uh, so for example, um, one of the sentences here, just to, to take one that I thought was an example of this. And, it's so unobtrusive, it doesn't seem like an issue of style. It seems like there is no particular style in this because there's no there's no Tom Wolf style pyrotechnics where you have all these this funny use of words. But there is a style to it, and the, the unobtrusiveness of it is the style. So let me just read the sentence. If you pronounce Laurel and Yanni and pay attention to how you have to hold your mouth and tongue to make each, to make each of the sounds, you will notice that the words are exact opposites of each other. Now, the grammatical structure here, I said, it's very direct and very use of, act, of active verbs. So it's like, if you pronounce and pay attention, you will notice, right? That's the fundamental structure of the sentence. It's, if you do this and that, then this will happen. Or if you do this and that, then you will do this other thing. So it's a very, you know, direct, straightforward, this, then that, then the other thing kind of sentence structure to it. And I was trying to do that in order to create maximum clarity around what is a you know, very abstract and difficult to convey topic. And that's another thing, you know, I, I even, uh, um, uh, that's another thing that I was sort of trained in when I uh, 
I, I was not trained in this in academia. In academia, I was trained in the opposite direction. Uh, but I was trained in this in my first job outside of academia, working for a financial publication, where the idea was, you know, you're writing, uh, you're writing for business people, you're writing for investors, you're writing for people who just want to get this information in the clearest, simplest possible way. And you're writing these very, I was writing these very short little blurbs. And that idea of having drilled in the, you know, direct, uh, uh, clear structure and uh, clearly structured direct grammar, uh, simple, straightforward, logical construction was very much programmed in at, uh, as part of my, as, as, that, as that part of my education as a writer. Uh, and the same person who, who trained me in that, um, a guy named John Reckenthaler, who eventually fired me from that job. And I never, and my, I, I'm very ashamed of the fact that I never got around to thanking him for it. I thought you did. Uh, you no, I never have. I, never, I need to track him down and send him an email or something. But I never got around to thanking him for it because I didn't really want to be doing that job. And I was, at, it, it, I got to a point where I just really wanted to be doing anything other than writing about mutual funds. But he taught me some good things. And one of the mantras he had was short Anglo-Saxon words. Right, so you know, when 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 uh, when writing, you should use short Anglo-Saxon words. You should you would never use a more complicated or convoluted Latin root word uh, when you can use. Go for the, uh, you know, this is what they say about Winston Churchill, the the famous "We will fight them on the beaches" speech. You know, we shall fight them on the beaches. They say there's not a word in that in that passage that isn't an Anglo-Saxon in origin. Right, so he's he's speaking to the English people on their most elemental primitive basic level by using ang only Anglo-Saxon words. Um, and that leads me down to the lowest, sort of the most detailed level of style, which is word choice. And I also used to spend the whole lecture talking about this. And um, uh, one thing that I noticed in reading Ayn Rand years ago that sort of leaped out at me a little bit was uh, it's, when she's describing Francisco D'Ancona early on in the, when she's first sort of introducing him in Atlas Shrugged, uh, she, the character of Francisco D'Ancona, there's a, uh, uh, a description that says, he spoke a precise cultured English, deliberately mixed with slang. And that kind of stuck, stuck out at me. I'm not sure how much I was influenced by this personally, but that I sort of strikes so. me as being very much my style in terms of the word choice and the how I how I what the kinds of words I use to describe things. So there, it, there the precise and cultured part is you know I'll reference Shakespeare, I'll reference Immanuel Kant, I'll reference I'll have you know literary references. The makers of matches and um, the uh, also the have have his background of in philosophy. I will have spots where I want to talk in a way that's very clear and precise and using words in exactly the right way. So you have exactly the right implications and, and you know, it's philosophically unimpeachable. Uh, and, you know, the, the, exact, the philosophical exactness of what you're saying, especially talking about an issue like the one in this article. But at the same time, they'll be thrown in there terms that are sort of informal and conversational uh, and give it a more down to earth style. Um, so one sentence that came out here. So here's a sentence where I'm trying very hard to use words in a very precise and even technical way, but then with a little bit of slang thrown in there. So I said, as in the case that there's a sentence from later in the piece, as in the case of the dress, the ambiguity is a byproduct of artificial reproduction, which can spoof a sensory apparatus adapted to perceive the real world. So I have terms like a sensory apparatus adapted to perceive the real world. Now this is all, you know, it's just not, obscure terminology. Uh, it's, it's English that any educated person can understand, but it's being used in a very a distinct, a very exact and precise way. But in there is the word spoof, right? And I actually looked up the use of the word spoof here. And it turns out it's, it's such a, it's such a, it's a, the spoof is a slang term, but the specific way I'm using it here is actually a fairly recent version of the slang term. So spoof in the older version is sort of a term for satire, right? You do a spoof on something, you do a satire. You take some real thing and you exaggerate it to the point of ridiculousness in order to satirize it, and that's a spoof. But in the more, a more recent way of using it is in the tech field of technology, where you talk about spoofing an email address, right? So it's a way of uh, taking advantage of the technical 
uh, knowledge of the operation of a, of a the operation of a mechanical system in order to fool that system into doing something that that it's not designed in order to do, make it do something that's against its design or that it's against the intention of its designers. So it's often used by hackers that you're spoofing something, but you know, making it, uh, or it's, it's used a lot to actually now, I, I came across it a lot in recent years in talking about self-driving cars because self-driving cars have to have these complex programs for analyzing visual data. So they know, oh, is that somebody on a bicycle next to the car that I don't want to hit? Or is that an oncoming traffic? You know, and they talk about different things that can spoof that software. Uh, and make it make the car think, make the self-driving car think that something is different than what it really is. Right, so that's a somewhat new version of the slang used from the tech world. So I'm using again comp, you know, some sort of complex and technical philosophical terms along with something that's a slang term. Or later on, a couple more examples of this. Uh, I talk about how I've I've hacked my way through the critique of pure reason, right? So I said, I'm not, I read it carefully. I did a close reading and that would be the academic form yeah. of saying it. It's not a formal way of saying I hacked my way through it. So sort of deliberately juxtaposing the thing of reading, you know, talking about a, a, an obscure philosophical treatise and then deliberately contrasting that with this image of hacking your way through it. Like you've got him, you're like you're with a machete going through the jungle. Um, uh, or there's a sense when I talk about the uh, Laurel and Yanni and the the the, the gold the, the blue and black dress versus the white and gold dress, I have a sentence here that says uh, I want to just call out a couple bits of word choice here. So the sentence is: This seems insane to those of us who clearly hear Laurel, who hear, clearly hear Laurel, just as the whole gold and white dress thing seemed insane to those of us who clearly saw that it was blue and black. Now. Notice that using insane is like a more uh, informal and conversational way of saying something. You know, I'm not trying to say there's, there are a lot more, there are other ways you could have put that that would have more, seemed more formal or more academic or more like you're trying to be very restrained and modulated. And if you were writing in an academic context or you might use that, or if you're writing in a technical context, you might use it. But it's more of a, you know, it's calling it insane uh, sound is more of a casual, uh, informal, conversational way of doing it. Or talking about, I, I refer to the whole gold and white dress thing, right? So I don't say the incident of the gold and white dress or the case of the, the paradox of the gold and white dress. I said, yeah, the whole, the whole white and gold dress thing. Uh, it's a more casual and informal and conversational style. Uh, similarly, I talked a little bit later about how, when I'm talking about the uh, how the auditory auditory illusion is produced, I said, well, if you if you boost the uh, higher frequencies, it sounds like Yanni. If you boost the lower frequencies, it sounds like Laurel. Well, the term boost, right? You you could, there's you could think of all the different words you could use for that. You could just say increase. That's kind of a dull, but a dull but descriptive term. Uh, you could use something more technical. You, but you know, using boost is again a more conversational, informal, almost slang-like uh, way of putting it. It's yeah, and I think visual it's too. it's visual and it's a little adds a little excitement too. Um, but the big thing is that you'll notice there in this article, and this is something that is an aspect of style of my style, is. Uh, what I call sort of a conversational approach. And there's a, the first big transition you get to is a great example of that. And here's what, how I write it. So after giving a brief description of the Laurel versus Yanni thing, I say, ah, but the state of the world being what it is, we can't just be content to view this as a fun intellectual puzzle. No, the bad philosophical hot takes can't be far behind. Is there such a thing as a philosophical hot take? Oh yes, yes there is. So uh, close quote. So. This is the conversational styles. You put things like well and ah, and you know, these sort of conversational placeholders, you put them in in a way that doesn't really, you know, is not at all necessary for writing. It's the sort of thing that you would say if you were talking and you put it into the writing and it gives you more of the sense of you having a conversation with the reader. Uh, um, it gives it more of an oral versus rather than written uh, style to it which gives it that feeling that is, again, conversational. 
And that's sort of trying to take the idea of, so we're going to talk about very highbrow ideas, but we're going to do it in a way as if you and I were sitting down, you know, over a beer, having a conversation over this. Now, the other thing you'll notice that a little, like a little bit of slang mixed in, right? So hot take is a bit of slang. It'd be, I don't know if people are familiar with that one as much. It's uh, anybody who reads a lot, if you, it's, it's sort of spread a lot in the media in the last 10 years. Um, I apparently, I looked it up, but apparently it came about 10 years ago. It emerged from sports journalism. Uh, so a take in journalism, and that's like the long standing usage where it's an interpretation of, event, of, of, of some facts or events, right? So the president gave a speech and, and Joe, what's your take on this, right? So you're getting, it's your interpretation, your spin, your um, evaluation of some event that has happened. And what is a hot take? Well, a hot take is one that comes in hot, right? It's, it's one, it's a, it's a interpretation that is meant to be provocative and specifically it's used as a pejorative because it's specifically meant to refer to an interpretation of events that is meant to be provocative rather than be true or thoughtful, right? So where you're, you're, you're trolling people, you're trying to get people riled up and you're trying to you know, bait the click. You're trying, it's, it's like similar to click, a hot take is similar to clickbait. Yeah, you're trying to get people to click uh, on, uh, to, to go onto their mouse or cursor and they cl and click on your story to read it because you've offered them something extremely provocative or controversial that may not make any sense whatsoever. All right, so that's why, you know, the idea of talking about a philosophical hot take is again, an example of this idea of, of highbrow uh, uh, philosophical discussion mixed with a little sprinkling of uh, um, uh, a little sprinkling of, of slang, and here's where the English language. You know, when we talk about word choice, and this is really where the, the fertile field of individual style comes in, because uh, I used to talk about how uh, there are various different estimates, but there's roughly six hundred thousand words in the English language, and it gives this tremendous field of variety for any concept you want to express. There is not one word for that concept. <laughs> there are multiple words for different shades and variations of that concept. Um, and this has been developed partly through the incredible invent inventiveness of wordplay, which has been programmed into the English language from the very beginning. Um, I mean, if, if you read Shakespeare, uh, the, one of the reasons why Shakespeare is considered so foundational to the study of, of English is, and he's sort of considered almost like the father, one of the fathers of modern English, is that first, for one thing, he, he invented a whole bunch of words. There's like phrases, a couple yeah. hundred words and, and, and phrases and figures of speech that were first used by Shakespeare. He invented them. Uh, and you can look up there, go online and look up their lists of people compiled of words that did not exist until Shakespeare made them. And a lot of them are very common everyday words that we use today. But it came out of the fact that in this Elizabethan style of writing, wordplay and puns and very complex uh, allusions were all pr part of the, the, the dominant style of the era. And that's, you know, that's the reason why I think why people have to attune their ears to Shakespeare. It's not just that you know, he uses slightly different words and these and those and that kind of thing. That's the easy part. The hard part is that Shakespeare is assuming that you're listening very closely and keeping track. He's got a, it, it, he's kind of like a juggler. There's always a lot of uh, rhetorical and conceptual balls up in the air. And really a, a, a concept that he brings up early in this uh, one sentence that he's gonna tie back into in the next sentence. And he's expecting you to have that remembered in the back of your head from, the, from you know, a couple lines earlier. So there's this tremendous sort of complex wordplay and, and puns and all these things going on in his writing. And that was the, 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 the fertile creative ground in which the English language was made. And that is part of the reason why we end up with 600,000 words in the dictionary is we had guys like Shakespeare going around and saying, well, what if we take this word and mash it together to this word? Or we take the ending from this word and we put it onto this completely different word over here. And you know, it leads to the fact that you know, as an American, it's it's in the Constitution somewhere that you can add I, you can add i z e to the end of any word and make it into a verb. Uh, so the, you know this all goes back to the beginnings of the English language. So the tremendous inventiveness, it also comes from the polyglot origins of the English language. So a number of years back, there was a story about how there's a French language academy that's in charge of policing the French language. Um, 
And they had this like list of prohibitive words they were trying to get rid of, like le weekend, right? So they didn't want these English words coming in and polluting their pure French language. Well, the English language's approach to words is the exact opposite. And there's a, a famous quote, I, I didn't realize how recent this was. In 1990, a blogger and science fiction review, uh, science fiction book reviewer named James Nichol wrote this quote that's been uh, going, around the, going around a lot since then. He was writing about what he calls, quote, the problem with defending the purity of the English language. And he describes it this way. We don't just borrow words. On occasion, English has pursued other languages down alleyways to beat them unconscious and rifle through their pockets for new vocabulary. <laughs> so, you know, English is borrowed from Greek and from Latin. It's from the Germanic Saxons and the Norman French. It's, um, Ayn Rand makes a couple the mentions. Norse. Uh, the Norse, yes, because they settled in England as well. Well, Ayn Rand mentions um, Sir Walter Scott a couple times. And there's a delightful uh, little section. It's one of these things where like a little essay inserted that really has nothing to do with the plot, but is fun on its own, on its own, sort of like what Victor Hugo does, where it's, where it's interesting on its own grounds. So he has a whole, at the beginning of Ivanhoe, he has a whole little essay about how the Norman conquest can be seen in the English language to this day, because the word for an animal, uh, the, the word you use for an animal when you're tending it in the field is a Saxon word, like cow or sheep or pig. And the word that you use when it's served to you on the table is a Norman word, a French word, pork, beef, uh, or um, like mutton, I think was the word uh, for, for sheep. So he's saying, you know, basically, you know, the, after the Norman conquest, the guys who spoke French were the guys sitting at the high table, uh, eating the food and having it served to them. And they would use the French words for the, you know, what they saw sitting in the platter in front of them. And the guys who were out there, you know, out in the fields tending the flocks, they were the Saxons and they would use the Saxon word. So he's talking about that you could see the Norman conquest still frozen in the English language in that way. But then we went on to borrow from African, from Chinese, from Japanese, you know, the word, uh, well, gung ho from Chinese and uh, tycoon from, uh, from, from Japanese. Uh, ketchup is based on a uh, Chinese word for a fish sauce. And we, we stole some of the um, uh, ingredients and spices from it and then you know, turned it into the distinctive American and British uh, condiment of ketchup. Uh, so because of that, you get this just, just tremendous variety of different shades of meaning and different ways you can express any idea that you want to express. So one uh, exercise I used to give my students is to come up with as many different ways as you can of saying my opponent's position is wrong, right? So you can think of some basic things like it's my opponent's position is in error, right? And you can see the implication. You know, if you say it's wrong, there's something you know, wrong has a double meaning. It's it's a, a both a epistemological term, but it's also a moral term. There's a little bit of judgment carried in the word wrong, whereas in error implies tends to imply an honest error. Well, look, I, you know, I think you may have an error there. Um, you know, it's a more Minnesotan way of, of, of arguing against someone. Uh, actually, in the, in the movie Fargo, they have, uh, so I can't quite, I can't 100% agree with you there. Is, uh, you know, that's, that's like a really harsh way for a Minnesotan person to disagree with another person. Can't, can't quite 100% agree with you there. Um, and uh, so the, I, I had, I gave my students to the, the a job of saying, okay, come up with as many of these as you can. And, and typically people would come up with, you know, 15 or 20 and somebody would come in and they had 40 and they thought they'd done really well. And it was pretty good. But I had a master list that I think topped out at 288. I, I, there's still stuff I could have added, but I got up to 288 before I quit. Because there's so many different things. You know, for such a basic concept as right or wrong, true or false, there are so many different words you can use. Things like it's illogical. Right, so that you're not just saying it's wrong, you're saying a specific reason why it's wrong. It, it violates the rules of logic. You can say it's misguided. You're saying something about the person's intention. Your intentions are good, but you went, but you made a, but you, but you implemented them in a mistaken way. You could say it's a lie, right? That gives an idea of the moral content that you know it implies. It implies not only is the person wrong, but they know they're wrong and they're they're acting immorally to try to bamboozle you. Bamboozle, I think, was probably in there somewhere too. Uh, my opponent's position is balderdash, right? you, that you think it's so ridiculous it doesn't even need to be, be, need to be answered. 
Uh, one of my favorites is it's a quadlibet. That's a good <laughs> Latin term. Uh, and it basically means a sort of a, a quadlibet is uh, Latin for what you will, meaning that it's sort of invented on the fly, you know, and, and unconvincingly thrown together on the fly. Or a similar one, uh, you could say it's a farrago. I looked this one up just now, and um, it actually comes from the same root word as, as pharaoh, which is the word for, um, for wheat. Farrago was the Latin term for a, 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 a mixed grains. And so, you know, basically you're saying is this argument is mixed grains. It, it's a bunch of stuff just sort of thrown together at random that doesn't really cohere together into an argument, right? So there's all, and this, you know, this is just what half a dozen. You can see this huge variety of different ways you can, you can, you know, or, or you could call your opponent's argument a hot take, right? That's a new one. So there's all sorts of different ways that you can uh, uh, describe any, any concept with all sorts of different little implications. Um, and uh, so I talked about, you know, we, we talked about denotation and connotation. So denotation is the um, sort of dictionary definition of the word. It's the direct explicit meaning of the word. And then the connotation is every word has all sorts of associations that come with it, all sorts of associations that have to do, not necessarily with sometimes that, that flow implications that flow from the meaning of the word, and sometimes just things that are associated with the way in which the, the context in which you would expect that word to be used. What kind of person would use it? Like if I say that's balderdash, you know, there's an old fashioned kind of Victorian feel. I should be, I should have a big mustache and be wearing a top hat. If I don't, if I call and a monocle, yes. If I call your, if I, uh, even more so, if I call your argument poppycock. Uh, so there's you know, something, a, a word can be can seem old fashioned and stuffy. It can seem uh, vulgar. It can seem modern. It can, you know, there's also so you have all these layers. In addition to this, the the exact shades of meaning in terms of the definitions, you have also all this vast network of associations that every word has, and it gives you this tremendous uh, um, uh, a scope for for very detailed expression. Um, so you'll see, for example, that uh, when I talk about uh, the, uh, the Kantian view, this, this view that we're, you know, everything's subjective and there's no real reality, um, I say, uh, uh, unfortunately, Kant's arguments attempting to undermine the evidence of the senses are the ultimate basis for a lot of mischief in the modern world. Now, the interesting thing, though, is I say mischief, and then I go on to what are the examples I give? Uh, from two and two make five if the Fuhrer wills it, which is a famous quote attributed to um, um, Gehring, Hermann Gehring, uh, to the dogged nostalgia for communism that persists in defiance of all evidence. Uh, so here I'm, I'm using, when I say it's mischief, and then I bring up, well, there's the Nazis and the communists and they killed 100 million people. That's, clearly, I'm, by choosing the word mischief, I'm going for a sense of ironic understatement, right? Uh, or then I say, you know, the next sentence after that is, Manny has a lot to answer for, right? So it's, uh, there's a little bit of irreverence in that uh, in using the, in referring to Immanuel Kant, the great uh, 18th century philosopher as Manny. Now I did that purely to tie into the Yanni and the headline and, and sort of bring the reader in, but also to provide that sense, a little bit of humor and a little bit of irreverence on top of, to, to leaven the fact that I'm also dealing with a, a very deep, um, a, a very deep and uh, uh, very abstract philosophical issue, a heavy and abstract philosophical issue. Um, the style I, I generally try to aim for, and the way I would describe it, and the, the, what sort of ties in a lot of these. So you know, I mentioned this being similar to the style that Francisco Dokenyi has of, of literate, cultured English mixed with slang. The way I would describe the style I'm going for is that I want it to be a little worldly wise and ironic, but without veering into the cynical. So sort of a less bitter version of H.L. Mencken, right? Because H.L. Mencken veers into the cynical. He's you know, famously, you know, he's the one who said, was it uh, democracy as the idea that the common people know what they want and deserve to get it good and hard. Uh, so he had, he had that this sort of bitter cynical edge to the, he he make these sort of gimlet-eyed observations about the world, like you know he had this sort of 
I've, I've been around, I've seen it all, you know, nothing surprises me, you know, not, no, no human folly really surprises me or upsets me because I've seen it all, that sort of attitude. But he did it with a bitter and cynical edge and I'm trying to do it without the bitter and cynical edge, but had this idea that, all right, you know, there, there are these bad ideas and there's bad consequences that flow from the bad ideas, but we can understand them and we can make a, a, a ironic and uh, sometimes sarcastic comments about them. But at the same time, you know, we're also trying to preserve the good ideas and trying to uh, understand, you know, what the, what the correct and accurate view of the nature of consciousness is. So we're not just trying to tear down Immanuel Kant. We're trying to understand what is the truth, and how can we how can we understand how we actually do gain knowledge. Um, And that's the last one I want to end with is the connection of style and sense of life. So I've mentioned a couple of times before, so on this level of word choice and how you, how you, how you talk about things and what words you use to describe them and the, the sense that you're giving to your, to your reader, it's the tie between a nonfiction writer and a fiction writer, because we are both dealing with things on the sense of life level. Uh, that is, you know, I, I'm talking about things that actually happened. But what I can, and so I can't change the facts that actually happened out there in the world. I can't change what somebody said about Laurel versus Yanni. I can't change the science of it. But what I can bring to it is my attitude toward it and the attitude toward it that I convey to the reader. So it's like, these are true things that happened, but I'm selecting which of the true things that happened are worth talking about. I'm selecting the style of thinking and the structure of the article, the style of thinking, the how, how methodical versus scattershot the, the thinking is that I'm going to do about it. I'm, uh, uh, I'm selecting the kind of sentence structure, the clarity of the sentences and the directness of the sentences and suiting that to trying to uh, convey a certain way of thinking and reacting and a certain attitude Towards these, towards towards the towards the facts or issues that I brought up, and then in the word choice, I'm conveying, you know, how are am I bitter? Am I angry? Am I um, am I idealistic? Uh, am I uh, 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 you know can I can I can I confront an unpleasant fact without becoming bitter? And can I? Uh, uh, and, and you know how what is my level of enthusiasm or interest in a subject? So there's all sorts of things in this. You know, uh, can I convey that I think this is interesting and important? Right, that that word interesting and important comes up again. So there's all sorts of things that you can do in in, in the a nonfiction style that are conveying to the reader not just here are the facts, but here are how I think you should think and feel and react to the facts. And uh, I can provide, you know, uh, she said, uh, you know, I, I, the, one of the things that, that Ayn Rand talks about in here, which often comes up in politics, because often in politics, the news is bad, or there's something really awful coming on, going on in the world, there's a big crisis, there's a war, there's an economic crash, et cetera. And Ayn Rand talked about uh, uh, with, she said, what she liked about Dostoevsky is, it feels like going through a house of horrors, but with a powerful guide. And so that's something I always aim for, especially when the news is bad, that I am your guide to, you know, this is the bad, this, I have, there's bad news to deliver. I am your guide through that. And I'm here to help you understand it and to help you get through it and to help to have confidence that you can understand this and comprehend this and deal with it and get through to the other side, no matter how bad the news might be. Uh, so that's the way in which even a nonfiction writer is really up to his neck in all these same sense of life issues uh, uh, in terms of his style of approaching uh, the topics he writes about in this in much the same way that a, that a fiction writer is. Wonderful. Rob, that was fantastic. Just simply loved it. Thank you. Thank you. So let's start with questions. Uh, Jonathan, you're first. Thank you, Shikan. Yes, so my question is to Rob. In our breakout room, you mentioned one technique for improving your style is to find authors whose style appeals to you and then program that into your subconscious. And so I want to know about methods 
of emulating style and programming that into your subconscious. So taking a way of thinking or word choice that is foreign or alien to you and then making it yours and the process for doing that, tips for doing that and so on. Uh, okay, so um, an analogy I'm going to use here actually is something Sherry found, a clip, a uh, video clip Sherry found once. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is a an opera singer named uh, German opera singer named Thomas Quasthoff is his name. Yeah. And he was doing a, a voice. He he has a, a deep bass voice. Um, and uh, he was doing a seminar for young opera singers. Master class. Master class, I guess. Yeah. And he had a, uh, a female opera singer and he was, she was trying to improve the tone of her singing. And he says, well, try singing. She was singing, it. she had a particular piece she was doing. He says, try singing it in the style of Jesse Norman. Yep. And the woman sings it. He says, okay, so what I want you to do from now on is sing everything in the style of Jesse Norman. Because <laughs> you know, by imagining how another singer would sing the piece, she had brought out the quality in her own voice that she was trying to, trying to improve. Well, then the funny thing is no. that he himself <laughs> saying like Jesse Norman. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's like a, a deeper, richer, throatier kind of sound, I think, as I would recall. Uh, but so the thing is, you, you can't actually literally do it as I'm going to sing everything as if I'm impersonating another singer, right? It has to become your own style. It can't just be imitation. But sometimes by imitating bits and pieces and parts of another writer, you will sort of improve the qualities in in this you know like, like she's improving the qualities in her own voice that she was trying to she was trying to figure out how to increase these certain qualities in her own voice that she wanted to increase and by imitating somebody else she got a sort of a clue to how to how to do that now the next step is you can't do it just by imitation you have to then per, you know having learned to access that quality that you want you have to learn how to bring it out naturally uh, in your own voice. Uh, and that's sort of what you have to do as a writer. And, you know, I think most young writers end up being imitative to some extent um, because that's, you know, that's what you do. You, you find an a, a author you like. And in my, I think in my case, what I remember is to the extent that my writing was imitative when I was starting out, it was because I saw other writers do something, you know, a particular way of, of phrasing something or a particular kind of sentence or a particular kind of way of bringing humor in and I would say, that looks like so much fun. I want to do that too, right? So it's not, I'm trying to imitate this person. It's more like, I want in on the game. This looks like fun. I want to do this also. Didn't you imitate me once recently? Imitate you in writing? Yeah. Well, I've, I've, actually, I have learned how to imitate Sherry in writing yeah. because um, <laughs> hilarious. I'm, well, I'm frequently her editor. And you know, I believe strongly as an editor, your job is not to, not to squash down the other person's distinctive voice your job is to understand what the other person's distinctive voice is. So sometimes when I'm suggesting how she could rewrite something, I try to rewrite it as if I were her, you know, sort of in <laughs> something that's, that is as close to her voice, uh, quote unquote voice, literally as I can come up with. Cause I have, I know her voice. Yeah. I've, I've, I've edited her so many, edited her work so many times. I read her work so many times. I know how she goes about writing something so I can sort of, try to figure out how would how would she say this as opposed to how would I say it. Wonderful. Next up is going to be Ash, Joe, and Judith. Ash. Hi, thanks for that presentation, Rob. Um, so you mentioned outlining and uh, you didn't really go into detail. You mentioned you're against like the Roman numeral system and I've taken a class from you before, but it was like 20 years ago or something. So, and I know you could do like a whole other presentation on this probably, but just like in a nutshell, could you expand a little bit more on what your method of outlining is and uh, what you would recommend? Okay, so this is partly um, my sort of cure for writer's block, because I actually don't believe that writer's block is a real thing. I think it comes from, I think writer's block tends to come from, I mean, if you, if you literally don't, I, I, there's hardly anybody who doesn't have any ideas, right? Uh, you know, if you are, engage in and reading about and talking about and have actually are an expert on if a subject is important enough to you that you want to write about it, you probably have ideas about it. So it's not that people are out of ideas, it's that they get they get hung up in the process of getting those ideas out. So part of my approach to outlining is also an answer to how do you how do you smooth that process and get rid of those blocks. And the biggest block people have is 
that is prematurely judging their work, right? So if I tell you, come up with an idea for this, but make it a really good one, <laughs> right? How, what's that going to do to you? It's going gonna, it's gonna to paralyze you a little bit. I mean, or maybe you won't be intimidated by it, but you know, if, if you're young, especially you're starting out and you're just trying to learn to write, uh, this will intimidate you. You'll be like, oh my gosh, you know, and if you try to say, only give me the good idea, if you try to go to your subconscious. Now, Srikant's going to talk about level one and level two in this whole terminology there. <laughs> but we talked about this, we had a whole meetup about this once before, about how writing is largely managing your subconscious. So if you go to your subconscious and say, only give me the good ideas, and if you give me a bad idea, I'm going to be really mad at you. Mm. The subconscious is going to hunker down, it's going to play it safe, it's not going to give you what you need. So the first step is always uh, to just simply throw your ideas out on paper, you know, at random, without any idea that this has it has to be that the ideas have to be correct, that they have to be stated well, that they have to be in the right order. Just get as much out on paper as you can Look at first, up. and it's a core dump, Sherry called it. You know, you yeah. just you take everything that's in your memory core and you just dump it out there in no particular order. And then once you've got it on paper, it's there, it's objective, and you can start just moving it around piece by piece and saying, well, you know what? Logically, people need to know this before they can understand this point, before they can understand this other point. And this point over here, actually, I don't think that's really true. So I'm going too far on that one. That I don't have the, the I don't have the, I can't think I can support that point. This other point over here is kind of irrelevant to the main topic. I, I can get rid of that. So you can just start sorting it through and you just sort through it one bit at a time you know, uh, and it makes it into a set of easy, easily manageable tasks. And uh, then the, the big thing about the Roman numeral outline, the Roman numeral outline, so I got this from Peter Schwartz, who, who used to evade against the, the Romanizers, as he called them, uh, <laughs> which I thought was a sort of quasi-religious way of referring to it. Uh, but the Roman numeral outline is the wrong kind of outline because it's not the kind of outline you need as a writer. Because the Roman numeral outline, as we all learned in high school or, or earlier, is you have a top level and then you have a lower level and a lower level and a lower level. It's hierarchical. But when you're writing, you don't write hierarchically. You write sequentially, right? So knowing, so no, so what I do usually as a writer is I come up, you, as I come up with a sequential outline. So it's a series, it's a number, it's a series of, of like numbered points. Like, Point one, point two, point three, point four, through like maybe you know nine or eighteen, however big the article is, and then within those those you know within that sequential outline, there can be larger divisions. We're like, okay, well, there's a first part, there's a second part, and a third part, but you don't want to think of it ever as hierarchical. Like you're working on like a part one, you know, the capital I for the Roman numeral, and then below that there are three points, you know, one, two, and three, and then below that. You, know, you you get like five layer levels of outline, and that's that's unusable as something you can actually use to prompt your subconscious. Because what you want to do is you want to dump out all the stuff and material you have in your subconscious. Then you want to analyze it. You want to look at it. You want to reorganize it. You want to see is there something missing? Do I have? Is there are there things here that shouldn't be there? What order should they go in? And then what you want to get as at, at the end of that process, what you want is a sequential outline that I think of as marching orders, where each point is. Okay, so make this point, and each point is that each one of those is a fairly simple command that you're giving to your subconscious to say, here's a very narrow, here's a narrow, delimited, specific point, and I just need to write a couple sentences or a paragraph or two to explain what that point is, and that becomes a much simpler task that you're giving yourself. So it really means, you know, as it, the the point of outlining is not only to be able to give yourself a coherent structure to the article but also to give yourself a arrive at a coherent structure by a process that is a series of simple steps that doesn't overwhelm your subconscious and give it too much to do at once. And then take that structure and implement it through another series of you know, broken down, simple, one step at a time uh, instructions to say, okay, write a paragraph about this, about this point, and then write another paragraph about that point, and then write another paragraph about that point. And then, of course, I also make the point that that as part of this thing of giving your subconscious one thing to do at a time, you also take the point the the fact that making everything flow together and having the exact right words and all that—that's a whole other stage, right? That's the editing stage. So once you've got a first draft, 
a first draft is, you know, the most liberating thing I tell my tell people is your first draft is not supposed to be good. Your first draft is supposed to suck because it's your first draft, right? Making it good is what you do in the second draft, you know, is, is what you do after the, the first round of editing and then the other second round of editing. Making it, you know, I, I actually did this once where I took an article that I had written at the time, this is about 20 years ago. And I gave my students a, uh, uh, the first draft of it. And I'm reading through the first draft and thinking, I'm giving them this article to read, this is terrible. <laughs> Then I, then I looked at the second draft, I'm like, oh, I realize now all the things that I fixed from the first draft to the final draft and all the different little word changes I made and, you know, I, I changed, moved the sentence here and there. Um, with Jack Wakeland, he used to call, he used to call it paragraph jujitsu, where I'd say, oh, you've got really good paragraphs here, but they're in the wrong order. And I just, you know, switched them around a little bit and the whole thing would flow uh, much better. And, it, you know, because you'd write a really good paragraph, but he put them in the wrong order. <laughs> So that's all the stuff you're doing and your that's, you know, so just the liberating knowledge that your first draft is not supposed to be good. It's supposed to be bad. And the job of making it good is what happens under, and you know, you do a couple more round passes of proofreading and each pass is making it better and honing it in. Well, next up is Joe followed by Judith. Uh, Ash, you, uh, Ash, go ahead if you had to follow up. Thank you, that was awesome, thanks Rob. Okay. Uh, next up is Joe followed by Judith. So I'm just going to uh, just follow up. And we were, I was fortunate enough to have Rob in my breakout room. So, uh, but this idea of storytelling, one of the things they hammered home with us when I was being taught uh, how to write was that essentially the, you know, you have a beginning, middle and end, just like you were talking about the layering just a moment ago. But they said, you know, make sure essentially that you have your opening around 25%, your middle around 65%, and the end about 10%. And they had these percentages that they broke down. And it kind of made me like sick to my stomach to a certain degree because I'm trying to like, is, did I do too much at the end here? Did I do too much in the beginning? And, and did I not set it up simply enough? Or is that really a good way of actually maybe cutting out a lot of what you don't want like is that a good way of like all right my opening is too long and i didn't set up my my uh incentive like they would talk about an incentive a climax and and then uh a resolution and it, that's not totally different than what ayn Rand would do i imagine from the abstract to concrete to the concrete to the abstract but the but the resolution aspect of it but not to spend too much time on the resolution and not to spend too much time in the opening is that a good way of thinking about writing is that is essentially yeah well a, a lot of these are a lot of these things are th these are generally pretty good rules of thumb but you have to treat them as rules of thumb mm -hmm. and the problem is too many people especially people who uh, don't come from a writing background who haven't done a lot of writing to whom is unfamiliar i think a lot of people in business or technology who you know for whom this is kind of foreign they will want to take it as here's a formula Right, so you want a rule of thumb. You don't want a formula. I think it's if you give that rule to somebody who has a background in philosophy, they use it in the right way. But if you give that rule to somebody who has a background in math, they're going to use it very exactingly, <laughs> yeah. and that's going to stop them again. Yeah, and, and so the, the the thing is that everything you when we talked about telling a story uh, in the breakout room, we talked about how really that for nonfiction writing, the version of the story is, actually for both because I, Ayn Rand insisted on both, that the story is really, it's a logical progression of ideas, right? So, and in fiction, it's if a character, if you have this kind of character who does this sort of thing, here are the things that are going to have to happen logically that, that follow from that. Now, in the nonfiction writer, it's here are these things out in the real world, and here is the actual logical connections between them that I have identified that I'm trying to communicate to you. But in either case, a story really is like another word for, another way of presenting a series of logical connections. And so the structure really has to come out of the logical connections. And that's gonna be much more motivating to you as a writer, right? You're gonna say, I've, I've thought about this, I've understood it, I see the logical connections, and that's what I wanna to convey to the reader. And that's gonna be more motivating than, oh wait, I gotta come up with something, but it has to be only 25%. Right, and, and the, you know, those, those sort of formulas or 25%, those rules of thumb, those are something that really should be saved for generally for the editing stage, right? So after you have the first draft, then you say, wait a minute, okay, 
my introduction is really like half the piece, maybe I can cut it down. But when you're actually creating the piece, you just have to be focused on what is the internal logic of this message that I have to convey. Next up is uh, Judith followed by Rupali. Judith. Um, thanks, I have, uh, I wanna comment on both of the um, things you were talking about, the, the imitating and, and then the outlining. Um, so I had the privilege of like um, watching my daughter become a writer kind of self-taught when she was in high school. And then she would just use me as like, um, We lost her. Hmm? Okay, Judith. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So what did you get? And, uh, Judith, just uh, keep it brief, okay? Because okay. So I, well, it, so I like the, what Rob was saying about it being linear and logical because that's how I would see, um, I don't know if you heard, but like my daughter's writing very linear and logical. Um, so um, with the outline thing, I remember, if you remember that story, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, um, some many years ago, I remember her saying that this, you know, the story was so complex. There were so many different things going on. Um, what she had was post-it notes that she said, or something like that, all over a board that she had moving pieces to figure out how was she going to present her story, you know? So I imagine, it, but it's a lot more, um, has a lot more freedom than an outline. I think, you know, where you can sort of, you get your ideas down somewhere. These are the things that I need to somehow communicate. And then this is how they could link and this is how they could touch back um, and touch each other, you know? Wonderful. So uh, that's what I thought of when Rob was talking about the outline. Excellent. Regarding the imitating, if I could just ask oh, Rob, sure. or just I'm throwing it out there for everybody really. And Rob, then I want you to tear this apart. But what I saw her do was, um, Initially, she could just um, not tell a full story with full character development. She could just write beautiful descriptions, okay? Then she wanted to build characters. So what she did was like you were saying, imitate a writer, but what she did was took pre-made characters and internalized those characters and then made stories that were true to that, you know, those characters, personalities that somebody else had created, imitating, right? but creating her own story. And then she added later, so on top of that is like added um, dialogue. So she broke the um, process down into steps. So I don't know if that's, you know, that's self-taught kind of thing um, until she got educated, but um, maybe Rob has some thoughts on whether that's a good idea or not. Yeah, let me talk about that. Cause I'm, now you're talking about fiction writing and I'm not a fiction writer, but my understanding is this is exactly what a lot of fiction writers will do that they will take, uh, they'll start, especially when they're starting out, uh, they'll take a story or an idea. And actually, I mean, uh, we're just talking about this, that uh, musicians, uh, composers do this a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, was it the, was it uh, Rimsky Korsakov or something like that, who said, uh, um, you know, bad composers borrow, great composers steal. <laughs> and he, I heard this from a conductor who's giving a, a, a concert of music by John Williams, the great music movie composer. And he would do this thing where he would, and he had the orchestra do this thing where he'd play a little section from, you know, Luke Skywalker on Tatooine. And then he'd play a section from some uh, classical composer who had done something very similar. So this idea of taking inspiration from and borrowing from things that other people have done that's an excellent way when you're training yourself. Now, obviously you don't wanna just keep on repeat. If you keep on repeating, you're just plagiarizing. Um, but also there was a whole, you know, we talk about fan fiction today where people will do, start out, I'll do, they'll do Harry Potter fan fiction or um, Twilight fan fiction or something like that. And, um, you know, it's really a newfangled version in the era of copyrights. It's a newfangled version of what people used to do, which is they had, uh, there, you know, before you had the Marvel comic universe and the uh, Star Wars universe and all that, you had two big universes. You had classical, uh, a classical mythology, and you know the stories of the classical world, and you had the Bible. And artists would take stories, you know. So, okay, there's the story of David and Goliath. Let's take that and let's do a sculpture based on that. Or you would have, you know, let's let you know I, Homer, you know, Homer, the great Greek poet, did not create the characters of probably did not create the characters of Odysseus and Agamemnon and all and Achilles. These were characters from the mythology of uh, that he pulled out of the mythology of 
the uh, of his time, and then gave that his unique expression. So that is a, definitely a great way for a, a writer training to say to take to imitate, as long as you know that you know the goal is not just to imitate. Your goal is not just to be a knockoff Isaac Asimov. Isaac I, I Isaac Asimov was one of the writers that I was inspired by when I was a teenager. Uh, you know, so my goal is not just to be a knockoff Isaac Asimov. The goal is to find a way to train myself to be able to, to do out of my own mind and of my own creativity, the things that I like from Isaac Asimov. Excellent. So we have now only about uh, 14 minutes left and we've got Rupali, Les, Mike, Charles, and Joya. So folks, keep your questions and both answers uh, brief so we can get through all these five. Rupali. Hi, uh, thank you. So I have two questions. One is uh, resources for developing style. What are the different resources? I've used um, elements of style by Strunk and White and um, Ayn Rand's books on writing fiction and nonfiction. But is there anything else that you would recommend? So that's one question about resources. Okay. The second is um, <clears throat> for someone who's starting out in their career or who is in college, right? Um, developing their style with a sense of life, especially if um, the sense of life is not in alignment with what's popular thought. How do you give confidence to someone to kind of express themselves um, in their own style as they're developing in their career. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, on the thing about uh, resources, I would try to, you say, I have to, now I have to keep this brief, so that's, that's the tough part. <laughs> uh, uh, in terms of resources, uh, Strunk and White, when they say style, they mean something more, something much more simpler, which is, uh, you know, it's like AP style, Associated Press as its own style. It means like, how do you cap, what do you, how do you capitalize things? How do you use punctuation? Do you use the Oxford comma or do you not use the Oxford comma? Are you one of those monsters who does not use the Oxford comma? Um, that, that sort of thing. It, it's, it's on a lower level than you're, than you're looking at. Uh, one book I could recommend is called Less Than, Richard Mitchell, I think was the guy's name, Less Than Words Can Say. It's a very short, ver short book, but, um, very readable, and he was he talked about the basically the he, his big thing was inveighing against the uh, bureaucratic style, uh, especially of academia, and he had this great thing about uh, he wrote he took that you know we shall fight them on the beaches uh, speech from from Churchill, and he rewrote it as if it were a bureaucratic memo. Oh dear! <laughs> Everything was you know oh, like a, uh, resources were prepositioned on designated landing space. Uh, Instead of we fight fight at the beaches, its resources will be you know prepositioned at designated landing oh. space, and it just was you know it would inspire nobody to do anything, mm -mm. right? Uh, if if you actually gave a speech like that, you know the, the, we'd all be speaking German. We wouldn't have to worry about the this effect on English. We'd all be speaking German now. Um, so that's a one. Uh, yeah, that's a really good book, and and helps inspire people with this idea of grammar as a toolbox of expression. And as a reflection of thinking, rather than just a set of rules that you have to follow. Um, and what was the second thing? Oh, uh, encouraging people to develop their own style. So I want to again say, finding writers you like and emulating them and, and learning from them and just being well read is the first step to being a good writer, uh, because you know you have it gives you so much material to work with, seeing so many examples, so many models that you can then. Uh, it, it's like. Um, it's like uh, you know Michelangelo and the Belvedere torso, right? So the Belvedere torso was this torso, this ancient Greek sculpture that was unearthed in Italy about the time Michelangelo was young, and he was just fascinated with it. It was just a torso, but he was fascinated with the modeling of it, and would run his hands over it, and uh, and basically learned so much from that that he had a model of oh my gosh, this is how you can sculpt that he then used as as emul to emulate it as as fuel for his own creativity. And giving people the confidence to come up with their own style is really um, a matter of being able to practice in a way that you're not, maybe practice in a way where the stakes are not really high. So I would say if you're trying to develop your own, a young person is trying to develop your own style, write a blog, right? Write something where it's not, I'm going to get graded on this, or I'm going to get judged on this, or it's going to get published or not. 
and you're worried about the outcome, do a lot of your own writing that is for yourself or for a very small audience of people who are not going to be mean to you. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can just, you know, because practice, there's no substitute for just practice. Uh, I'll wrap up that. Yeah, one of my favorite quotes from Rob is that if you want to be a writer, write. Yeah, yeah I, I had somebody came up to me, I, I kind of want to be a writer. I'm like, well, you've got paper, you've got pencil, right? <laughs> There's nothing stopping you. <laughs> Nobody needs to give you permission to do this. Just start writing. And then, you know, now if you want to be a published writer, you know, that's a, a different issue. But if you want to be a writer, just write. Next up is Les. Les, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, it was great, Rob. I really enjoyed listening to your uh, presentation. I, I got a better understanding conceptually of... Uh, Everything I was, you know, I've read your um, publications, I think, for a couple of decades now, uh, the newsletter and, and other articles found it really enjoyable. And just to understand it clearer how you're, what you're actually doing with your, when you're writing was uh, invaluable for me. And I know even for my own business writing and stuff, I used the confidence I could see you projecting and incorporating that, you know, those kind of ideas into to that writing that I use. Uh, just, Two things. One, I noticed just on your article, which I thought was great. Um, did you mean, I just as a fact checker, did you mean to say David Hume as the uh, scholar? Oh, less, 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 less. We have to uh, just one quick question about writing itself. Go ahead. Okay, we'll just the M, the M dash. Did, uh, could you just slowly tell me what the M stands for in that dash? I know the dash is one. Yeah, well, it's, it, on that. The, it's, it's E M is the way it's spelled. Oh, e oh it's E M. Dash, but the M in it's a typographer's term, and it's basically it's from the old days of type of lead type. Yeah, and an M dash is a dash that is exactly as long as, as the, the letter, letter M. M. <laughs> it, it's that simple. There's actually also an N dash, E N dash, which is different from a hyphen. Like there's a, a hyphen is the shortest. An N dash is the width of an N, and an M dash is the width of an M. All it's, right. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's the longest dash, basically, is the upshot. Okay, so we're going to go with Charles, Mike, and uh, Joya. Charles, go ahead. Yeah, so first, uh, I just want to thank uh, Rob and Sherry and everyone involved uh, for the insight. Uh, on the topic of practice, yeah, yes, that's uh, definitely echo the sentiment that it's most important. So about that, uh, perhaps I'm not as autodidactic and self-motivated as a lot of people, but I do wonder, you know, whether you guys can recommend uh, any resources where people can get together. And uh, I guess for me, it's two parts. One is, are there pre-made writing plans or even the books you mentioned where people can, uh, you know, take an off the shelf uh, curriculum and practice their writing in a more structured way? And two, is there any groups where uh, I can receive live, like uh, more immediate feedback? So for me, that in particular, I find that to be uh, very helpful. Uh, it's almost like immediate feel feedback allows me to get rapid iteration. So uh, if anyone have any suggestions, I look forward to these um, either posted here or maybe on Discord. Yeah, so my version of this was my college roommates. <laughs> so I had like yeah, a room that I shared an apartment with three, three other guys. Uh, uh, and, you know, oftentimes we'd share, we'd write papers and we'd share it back and forth. We'd talk about what we were writing about. And you get lots of feedback on that. And uh, that was sort of useful having a peer group that you could test things out with. Um, and actually I was, you know, I was an early adopter of the internet. So, you know, I'm gonna do the old man voice. Back when I was a kid, oh, the internet didn't have pictures. All we had was text. And it was like, you know, it was a green text on a screen and we went through a mainframe and we used Unix. And it was, it was these Usenet, this, it was sort of, you know, it was online discussion groups. This is back when Shrikant and Rob first met each other. <laughs> yes, this is back in in, 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 in text in in text. text. Yeah, when, in text, when it was yes. just green. Yeah, and uh, so uh, anyway, so the writing for these little discussion groups and writing back and forth and just posting things back and forth. Now this was more than 140 characters at a time, uh, but just posting stuff back and forth. Uh, was a great practice because you, you know, you, you, you got all the learning of discussing ideas that were important to you, but also at the same time, practicing your way of presenting them. So anything like on the, if you could find a, a friendly internet discussion group, now, depending on what kind of writing you're doing, I'm sure there are all sorts of groups. And the great thing about the internet is I'm sure there are all sorts of groups out there 
that you can find who are you know fiction writers who want to share their work with each other or nonfiction writers who share a common interest who who want to share their work with each other i'm not sure what they would be for the you know for the particular kind you know whatever level you're at and whatever interests okay. you have whatever topic you're most interested in or, or genre or whatever but i'm sure they're out there if you look for them and i, I highly recommend that because that's a lot of what i did is arguing arguing with people on the internet <laughs> um yeah you know actually making some good use of it by using it as a way to hone my writing skills wonderful uh last two questions are from mike and joya mike you got 20 seconds oh <laughs> Uh, Asimov was one of my heroes, too. Uh, uh, he, he wrote for different purposes, and he wrote under different pen names, like Paul French and Nicholas Bourbaki, depending on how technical he wanted to be. Um, our friend Boyd uh, uh, wrote, uh, he, uh, well, I, the, let me pre uh, press up the predicate. You, sometimes you write to inform, sometimes you write to persuade, sometimes you write for both of those. Our friend Boyd wrote for both of those. Uh, he was moderately effective, uh, although some people think he was more effective. Would he be more effective with narrative or with prose or, uh, or some other media? Uh, and what, uh, what, how do you style your writing depending on what you want to do? Oh, that's an interesting question because yeah, I, I do do I mean I do change my style a little bit depending on whether it's um, a sort of a political action kind of thing that I want I want people to come out of this you know wanting to vote in a certain way or 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 yell at their congressman a certain way or 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 whatever versus something that's more like I want you to understand this you know where the goal is to understand what's happening and not necessarily to being able to change it. Um, so there is that. And also, I think that, you know, the big thing I've observed is, uh, I mean, what I'm doing right now is a bit of a departure for me. I do some radio, I do some podcasts and things like that. But my talking is not my preferred medium, because I always, I always, you know, I always get done with these and think, well, can I have a second draft? Because I, I could have said that a little bit better. So I'm, uh, I noticed that I am very much more of a writer than a speaker. And some other people are just amazingly, you know, much better than me as speakers at being able to say something in a really finished and polished way the first time it comes out of their mouths. And I'm like, how do you do that? Uh, so, um, you know, and it, so everybody optimizes, you know, through practice and repetition, everybody optimizes their skills for the sort of thing that they're trying, for the medium that they prefer uh, and, and what they're trying to do in that medium. Last question is from Joya. Joya, go ahead. So Rob mentioned that I was lucky enough to take a writing course that he gave many years ago. And as part of that class, he shared with us chapters from the book that he was writing on all of these topics. And you can tell how long ago this was because I printed these out uh, from <laughs> Yahoo Mail and uh, so that I would have it until the book came out. And uh, here we are almost 19 years later, uh, long enough that Jean Valjean would almost be let out of prison. So Rob, <laughs> when is this book coming out? So the problem I had with the book is that the minute That's I finished it, I wanted to change everything in it. I wanted to change it. I wanted to rewrite it from the beginning. So, um, and. Uh, Let me just say, it's not because I haven't tried to push this along. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually have, have talking about this now, it fills me with enthusiasm to do that. The problem is that, you know, the market for it is not going to be. Is not necessarily going to be very huge. So um, you don't know that. I, I see a market right here, Rob. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think it would be a good idea for me to actually revisit all that and rewrite it and and bring it back, bring it up mm -hmm. to the. It was sort of like I learned so much in writing that uh, by the time I had finished it, I had surpassed it. So I I think I want to revisit it and do it in a different way and produce a lot of that material. Wonderful. All right, folks. Uh, Rob, this was fantastic. This is just just great. So uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, and um, we're going to now take a short break and then we will reconvene. I'm going to keep the meetup open. So if you are, uh, Rob and Sherry, let me say bye to you so you can get, get yeah, there. Yeah, we got to get right. the phone run. Okay, all right. Bye, guys. Everybody. All right, so for everybody else, um, I have several several announcements. <laughs> 